can't see me. I'm invisible. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Graphic Content. I'm your host, Ty Kendrick, and today we're going to be talking about Grant Morrison's The Invisibles. This series was published by Vertigo Comics in the late 80s, early 90s, around the same time that Neil Gaiman did his Sandman series. Now, this comic actually shares a lot of similarities with the Sandman, similar themes. Um, it all comes down to who we are in the world, why we're here, what our purpose is, you know, all the, the really simple questions. <laughs> it shares a bunch of artists with Sandman as well, notably Jill Tom. Thompson. Grant Morrison, this was one of his first creator-owned series for Vertigo Comics. You probably know his work for DC, going on to do books like Batman Arkham Asylum, later on doing Batman R.I.P., Batman and Robin, which introduced Damian Wayne as Robin. He worked on the 52 weekly series, and then when the new 52 launched, he rebooted Superman, a really epic multiversity story that looked into the different parallel universes, even books like Seven Soldiers, where one individual superhero character, all part of a team of seven that never actually meet each other. If you know Grant Morrison's work, you know you are always in for a really heady, adventurous sort of time. This man's a genius storyteller. He's one of the best working in comics right now. The Invisibles in particular was a series that I had been looking forward to reading for years of my life. I had always seen it on the shelf. I had always recognized Grant Morrison's name. I've been aware of him ever since I was a kid reading his Justice League comics. The Invisibles was a book that I knew I needed to prep myself for and really get myself ready to fully enjoy it because it is a really heady book. I think I'm finally there. I'm only in volume one out of four, so I still have a good chunk left to go, but so far I'm really enjoying it. The Invisibles comes down to the notion of counterculture. This is a group of people who are, for the most part, invisible to the wider world, who serve as authority figures, and the Invisibles are actively rejecting that authority. They are trying to um, basically go on a mission of self-empowerment, try to make their lives better in the way that they themselves see fit, which really boils down to the essence of chaos magic. And if you're anything at all familiar with Grant Morrison, you know that he is a very vocal practitioner of chaos magic. I'm actually wearing a t-shirt today. This is the universal symbol for chaos magic. We're going to get a little bit more into detail about what that means here in a minute. In terms of the story here, it starts off with a character named Jack Frost. He's this kid from Liverpool, actively running away from school. He's got a teacher who really believes in him, sort of Dead Poet Society style, like he's the Robin Williams character, but the kid is just brushing it off, does not care. He wants to burn down the school just to show how little he regards authority. And he does. Um, no one can really pin it on him, but everyone knows he did it. So he gets kicked out, sent to a boarding school. And while he's there, he's met with a really creepy headmaster who's got like no eye socket, or no eyes in his eye sockets. So he's always wearing sunglasses. This guy is revealed to be part of this alien race that has infiltrated society. And they are forcing people to sort of do things, not against their will necessarily, but against their even awareness that they're doing it at all. Actually something that Chaos Magic speaks to, one of the main ones is sigil magic, and that is the creation of images. You see it all over the world, most notably in corporations like McDonald's who use the big golden arch that is their sigil. And when you see the arch, uh, whether it's across town or down the highway, you're like, okay, I know what's over there. I can go get myself a Big Mac. The sigil magic worked. Sigil magic is all over the Invisibles as well. There's even a character who's known as King Mob. He's kind of the leader of the Invisibles team. They're not really a superhero team, but more of a group of misfits and various counterculture figures who've come together as sort of a makeshift family. Much like the Doom Patrol, which is another series Graham Morrison is known for doing over the years, King Mob, he takes a contract job and he's looking for this special magic sigil. And the, the woman who gives him the job warns him, you'll know what it looks like when you see it. And so he goes off, he ends up uh, getting in this big firefight, kills a guy, and the blood splatter on the wall forms the sigil that he's been looking for. Later, Graham Morrison would even start to write himself into the book as the King Mob character. He modeled it off of his own appearance, being a bald man, King Mob would dress in a certain way with like a leather jacket and spikes and stuff and even in real life Grant Morrison started mimicking the way this character looked and behaved. He started using chaos magic in that way to turn his own life in reality the way that he'd write this character in the book. And as he started to do that and see the effects of it become more clear, he started meeting all the all these women of a certain type. Um, he started actually getting kind of sick when the character in the book would get sick. So it was uh, had definitely like a balance of pros and cons, you know, whether or not 
that it was um, an effective use of magic or even if you believe in it in the first place. You can um, learn all about this in uh, this beautiful four-hour interview between Graham Morrison and Kevin Smith on the Fat Man on Batman podcast. Link below in the description somewhere. So anyway, back to the book. After Jack Frost escapes from this boarding school academy, barely making his way out of an alien experiment, John Lennon <laughs> comes back to life for a minute. He and uh, Paul McCartney, Paul McCartney's still alive, but the Beatles are summoned by the Invisibles to create a new song, which is another piece of magic that Graham Morrison is cited as doing in real life. You know, Jack Frost is out there on the streets on his own now. He runs into a homeless man named Tom O'Bedlam, also one of the Invisibles. He kind of takes Jack under his wing in a bit of a mentor status, which really reflects the uh, hero's journey that Joseph Campbell is known for crafting. This is the old mentor who shows up to take the young protagonist, really teach him the ropes of his abilities. The old man shares psychedelics with Jack Frost, and the two of them trip out in the subway, go on this mental journey, they astral project, they fly around, and all the while, old man Tom is basically telling Jack Frost everything he needs to know about what it is to be an invisible, what it is to use the magic inside of him, how to do it. It's really similar to the scene in Netflix's Bandersnatch episode of Black Mirror, where if you meet the programmer and you drop acid with him, he kind of tells the main character all the rules of the game. This is a really similar instance of using psychedelics as a way to inform the reader, the viewer, all the rules of the setting. After Jack ends up getting wrapped up with the rest of the invisibles, they go off on one their adventures. So they sit around the seance, they have their the magic dust circle around them, it's their protection circle. All of their consciousnesses come together and they travel back in time with their body projections back to the French Revolution. Where they meet revolutionaries who are centuries ahead in terms of what it means to be part of the counterculture. What is really interesting about the whole seance, the villains over there, they have a church of the occult that is after the invisibles. They're sending agents out to find them. So one in particular, an assassin, finds them where they're doing their seance, and he goes in there, breaks their circle, and ends up cutting off one of Jack Frost's fingers while all of their projected consciousnesses are elsewhere. So <laughs> what's really interesting is as Jack Frost is on this spirit journey, he starts to feel really sick, and it's because back in his body, he has lost a finger and he's bleeding out. <laughs> it takes him a while for that pain to really catch up to his spirit, but once it does, Jack is forced to go back to the clock tower and confront this assassin and only one of the other visibles is there to help him. So that's going on simultaneously while King Mob and the rest are back in the French Revolution. So that's just one aspect of why this series is really wacky. There's so many more really out there concepts to the point where these aliens who infiltrated humanity look a lot like other sort of creatures from mythology, really similar to the Men in Black or the sleep paralysis phenomenon where they're wearing cloaks and they have sort of like bright eyes and masks and everything and even that looks really similar similar to uh, Dream from The Endless and Neil Gaiman's Sandman. So lots of uh, really similar pop culture stuff all over the place. Even Stranger Things in season two, the episode where Eleven meets Eight, that whole gang of people, that is so much like The Invisibles where they even have graffiti in the background referencing King Mob. Invisibles is not one to have left the public consciousness. Now I am going to show you what sigil magic is all about. Making a good sigil, you need to go into it with intention. I'm going to write my intention here is a message at the bottom of the paper. State your intention with a desire like I want or I wish. I wish you would donate to our Patreon. <laughs> It never hurts to have another reminder to do that. I wish you would donate to our Patreon. <laughs> I really do. Now the next step is you take the letters that you have and you cross off all the repeats. So there's an extra I, an extra W, Extra O, U, extra D, there's a T and an O. O, U, A, T, R, E, O, N. So these are the letters that we are left with. I'm gonna write them. We have I, W, S, H, Y, O, U, L, D, N, A, T, E, N, R. So these are all <laughs> the letters here at the bottom that we have to work with there that we'll use for our sigil. So to get started, I'm just gonna go letter by letter and you can go left to right, double down, right, left, whatever you prefer. So I'm just gonna go left to right. I'm gonna start with the letter I. And now W, I'm gonna mark them off as I go. W I'm thinking, 
I'm gonna do that. So, so far we have our I and our W. The letter S, I think I'm gonna kind of replicate it here on the other side and try to go something like that, right? Kind of a nice complimenting shape. I feel like I'm Bob Ross right now with my narration. As far as H goes, I'm going to tack that on to the I. I'm actually gonna do it over here. Okay, that's my H. I kind of already have a, a Y shape right here if you can tell. So I'm gonna keep that Y in there without drawing anything. I always like to use my O as a circle around it all because it always helps to have a circle around it at the end anyway. I've already got a U, there's part of my W. The letter L, I'm gonna say that's part of the H there. I think this can kind of be combined into the letter D there with that W as well. We do need a good N, so I'm gonna go, I can kind of use that N make that part the A. I'm gonna expand that I earlier, make that my T, and then we just have E and R left. So the letter E also implement in there. We've got kind of an R shape going on there already, but this could just use one more diagonal perhaps. So that's kind of uh, the symbol I'm left here with my sigil at the moment. But to really decipher what's going on here, I'm gonna rely on some other colors. Trace back over the steps I've done. Maybe make that red. My straight lines of the whole outer circle red. And then maybe some of these inside squiggles that makes sense. They are yellow. I've got these sort of inner zigzags, good blue. And if I'm gonna redraw that, basically looking at the circle that we have, inner emblem go over all the lines but i think this is the major sigil image when all is cleaned up and whatnot it's kind of what we we have to to come out of it well well, that's it right there. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to use that for. Again, this is the symbol now that means please go donate to our Patreon. This is the gist of uh, sigil imagery. I hope um, that the editors sped up this video a little bit. <laughs> this is what uh, Graham Morrison does all throughout the Invisibles book. Be on the lookout for it. He does it in all of his work. So um, <laughs> thanks again for joining me here in graphic content. Hope you enjoyed that little uh, demonstration there. This show is bi-weekly every other Wednesday and I will be back again in two weeks. In the meantime, feel free to check Check me out on the 12th Level Intellects podcast, which is every other Monday, and the Legacies of the DC Animated Universe webcomic. You can find issues of that online at LegaciesDCAU.com. Feel free to check out all the other videos we have here on the Watchtower database. All the other co-hosts and uh, channel creators on here are awesome. And uh, check back here again in two weeks. I will see you then.